Hello?
forgot to know that. Forgot the note. Forgot how that song goes. Once was a young man named Roland Pied who played the recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing his recorder to rest a while from all his baking when suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath a swarm of flies. He put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, and covered the dead man with stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he needed. From that day on, Roland Pied was the happiest baker alive. He'd bake until he was tired, then he'd pull his recorder out of his pocket while his oven blade went on by itself. But Roland Pied lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor devised a plan to rid the town of Roland. 
In the beginning, he said that Roland was a good worker, but lazy. Next, he said that Roland baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he accused Roland of being a sorcerer. The people turned on him. Therefore, Roland Pye took his recorder and left his home behind. When Roland Pye came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners, but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he met an old busker and asked him for work to keep body and mind together. Come along with me, said the old man, and we will share alms. So Roland Pye, the old man, started going around and singing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget stand your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned sheen. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Everybody gave alms to the old man. But to Roland, they said, What is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire you, replied Roland Pai. That's what you say. There is a king with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages to anyone willing to feed them. So Roland Pied went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms he'd been sharing. The oven had never been used by anyone. Roland mixed the dough, then he rolled it into rings, then he boiled them, then he dressed them with seeds and baked them until they're golden brown. They tossed them into a crate to cool down. Whenever Roland wearied of baking, he'd play his recorder. And once he was weary of playing his recorder, he'd sing. Baker, why do you those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Hearing the singing, a princess looked out the window. She saw Roland Pye and fell in love with him. But she was a princess and he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They fled at night in a boat. They were already on the high seas when Roland remembered the busker. He said to his beloved, We must fetch the old man, since he shared his alms with me. We can't go off and leave him like that. At that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it had been dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, We agreed to divide everything we had, and I shared everything I owned. Now you have the king's daughter, you must give half of her to me. At this he gave Roland Pye the knife to cut his bride in two. Roland Pye took the knife with a trembling hand. You are right, he said. You are perfectly right. He was on the point of cutting his bride in two, and suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop. I knew you were a just man. I'm the dead man, mind you. Be covered with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. At this, the old man walked away on the waves. The boat came to an island rich in all good things, to the princely palace awaiting the newlyweds. The end.
thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, we're located on, um, uh, this location is on West Broadway and Main Street in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Not to Washington, Vancouver. Um, it's, uh, this is a, a doomed location though. It's, uh, uh, in a few months, I think in June, the end of June, uh, they're going to tear this whole block out and put in a SkyTrain, uh, station. So, uh, this location is, uh, only, it's been here for five years, but it's, uh, it's, only, it's, uh, it's days are, are limited. It's days are terminal. Nothing we can do about it. It's a sad, it'll be a sad day when this, this location closes. It's been open for uh, more than five years, I think. Nice, oh, thank you. I, I'm working on memorizing some other stories. I, I've been sort of reciting the same one over and over again for a very long time, so. Um, I'm glad that you, uh, I've enjoyed it the first time you've heard it. If this is your first time you've heard it, I guess. I also do poetry. And uh, I, I play the recorder a little bit. I've been learning. I'm not, a, I'm not a virtuosic player or anything. I know some tunes though. Toodlies, I got to, I get to do toodly toodlies. Toodly toodly doos. I know some toodly toodly doos. Brunswick, my famous Hanover city. The river west are deep and wide, washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you've never spied, but when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles, made the cheeses from the vats and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, they nest in men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking, shrieking, and speaking with fifty different sharks and flats. At last, the people in a body to the town hall came walking. Tis clear, cried they, our bear is naughty. Now for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with ermine. For adults who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old, no beast find in the furry civic robes ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking. Find the remedy we are lacking. For sure as fate will send you packing. At this merry corporation, quake and way in consternation. An hour they sat in council. At length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder, I admire and gow himself. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one frame. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap. Trap. Just see, so it's what you have. At the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, a little thing under his back. Nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister, than a too long open oyster. Save when at noon his paunch grew mutinous, for a plate of turtle green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on a mat. Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit a pat. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red. And he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin. And like loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuck of hair on cheek, nor beard on chin. The lips were smiling out and in, there was no guessing his kith or kin. And nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great-grandsire, 
starting up with the trump of doom's tone, had walked this way through the painted tombstone. He ran towards the council table, and please, your honor, said he, I am able, by means of secret charm to draw all the creatures living beneath the sun, that crawl or swim or fly or run after me, so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the pie piper. And here they notice round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat, coat of selfsame check. And that scarf sent on the pipe, and his fingers they notice were ever straying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as low it dangled over his vesture so old fangled. Yes, said he, Pied Piper as I am, in Tartaria cred the cam, last June from his huge swarms of gnats. I eased in Asia the Nizam of a monstrous brood of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand was the exclamation of an astonished Marin corporation. Well, into the street, the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept to blow his pipe, his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, he heard as if an army muttered, and muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling. Great rats, small rats, mean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the Pied Piper for their lives, from street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wester, where Noel plunged and perished. Save one who stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he the manuscript he cherished, to Ratland home his commentary, which was, at first shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as a scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into the cider press's gripe, and moving away of pickled up boards, and leaving a jar of concert cupboards, and joining the corpse of train oil blast, great news of butter casks, and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than by heart and by soldiers breathed, called out, oh, rats, rejoice, the world is grown to a vast very saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your lunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just a bulky sugar punch on, already staved like a great sun shone. Gracious, scarce an inch before me, just as we thought it said, come bore me, I found the west rolling over me. You should have heard the hammer of people ring the bells they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mare, and get long poles, poke up the nest and block up the holes, consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace, the first, if you please, by a thousand guilders. A thousand guilders? The mare looked blue, so did the corporation too. The county dinners made bear havoc with claret and sell, vinny to draw a pop. And half the money wouldn't punish, their cellar's biggest butter brennish. Pay the sum to a wondering fellow, a gypsy coat of red and yellow. Besides, quoth the mare with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with her eyes a vermin sink, and what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink, and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the guild is what we spoke, of them, as you well know, was a joke. Besides, a loss of made us thrifty. A thousand guilders come take fifty. Piper's face fell and he cried, No trifling, I can't weep beside. I've promised to visit my dinner time, Baghdad, except the crime that had took potage, all these riches, crowded left in the Caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions and a spider. With him I proved no bargain driver, with you don't think I'll bait a stiver, and folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook, being worse treated than a cook? Insulted by a rival, with idle pipe and vesture pival. Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. 
Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips laid his long pipe a smooth straight cane. An airy blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as that musician's cunning never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling, a merry crowd's jostling, a pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, and little tongues chattering. Like foals in a farm of barley is scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping ran merrily after. The wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood as if they're changed in the blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by. Could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back and how the mayor was on the rack and the wretched council's bosom beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the west rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters. I returned to southwest and to Copperberg Hill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed, great was the joy in every breast. He never lost the money talk, his force let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed. The piper advanced and the children followed. And when all were in to the very last, the door on the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? No, one was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way. And then after years, if you blame the sadness, you used to say, the draw of the towns of my playmates left, I can't forget that I'm bereft. Of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me, for he left us exactly the joyous land, joining the town in just at hand, where waters passed through fruit trees through, the flowers were poured with fairer view, and everything was strange and new. The sparrow was bred in the peacock here, and their dogs were round our fellow deer, and honey bees and lost their stings, and horses were born with eagles' wings, and just as I became assured, my little book would be speedily cured. The music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, to go down nothing as before, and never hear of the country more. Alas, alas, for Hamelin, there came to many a burger's pate, a text which says that heaven's gate opes the rich at as easy rate, as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mare sent east, west, north, and south, to offer the piper by word of mouth, wherever it was men's lot to find him. Silver and gold to his heart's content, if only he'd return the way he went, and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was lost endeavor, Piper and Dancer were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly, if after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear. And so long after what happened here, on the 22nd of July, 1376, in the better memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat, they called it the Pied Piper Street. Where anyone playing pipe or tabor was sure for his future lose his labor, nor suffered they hostile or his tavern, shocked with mirth his streets so solemn, and opposite the place of the cavern, there was a story on a column, and on a great church window painted, the same to make the world acquainted, how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And I must not admit to say, that in Transylvania there's a tribe of alien people who ascribe the way and dress of which their neighbors lay such things to their fathers and mothers having risen of some subterranean prison into which they were Japan a long time ago in a white band out of Hamlin towns in Brunswick land. But how or why you don't understand. So, Lily, let me and you be wipers of scores out with all men especially pipers. If they should pipe us free from that smite, if we promise them aught, let us keep our promise. I did that mistake free. That was good.
Nice. <laughs> that was random. Thank you. Adam's handler, no, I, I like your, I like your name, that's, that's sweet, Adam's handler. Uh, I get a kick out of word plays like that. I'm easily amused, I guess. Oh boy. Well, it's gonna be a long day. Gotta loosen my collar. It's one of those kind of days. I need extra oxygen to my head. There once was a rich man who had just one son. The boy was dearly loved by his father. As everybody knows, the greatest scourge on earth is a... Uh, let me start over again. There once was a young man, there once was a rich man who had just one son. The boy was dearly loved by his father. As everybody knows, the greatest scourge on earth for a rich man is work. Therefore, when his son turned 14, the father decided to send him to school to learn the science of laziness. On the same street as the rich man that lived with famous and highly respected professor, he never done a lick of work in his life he could get out of doing. The rich man called on him and found him stretched out in the garden under a fig tree with a cushion under his head, a cushion under his back, and a cushion under his buttocks. Before talking to him, I must first see how he does, said the rich man to himself, and he hid behind a hedge to observe the man. Professor lay as still as a corpse with his eyes closed. The only time he stirred was whenever he heard the thud of a ripe fake falling on the ground near where he lay. He'd reach slowly out, bring the fruit to his mouth, and swallow it. Then he wouldn't move again, he wouldn't, he wouldn't stir again until another fig fell. This is just the professor my son needs, decided the rich man. And he came out from his hiding place introduced himself and asked the professor to teach his son the science of laziness. Old man, answered the professor just above a whisper, don't talk so much. It tires me to listen to you. If you want to bring your son up as you and I are, just send him to me. So the rich man went home, took his son by the hand, thrust a feather pillow under his arm and led him to the garden. I urge you to do everything you see this professor of idleness do. The boy, who already had an inclination for that particular science, also stretched out under the fig tree. Observing his teacher, he saw him reach for every fig that fell and bring it to his mouth. Why should I work myself to death reach for figs, he thought. And he lay there with his mouth wide open. Soon a fig fell in his mouth. 
and he let it go down slowly. Then he reopened his mouth. Another fig fell, this time a mist. He lay there perfectly still and murmured, Why so wide of the mark? Fig fall into my mouth. Seeing how wise his pupil already was, the professor said, Go on now. You have nothing to learn from me. You can even teach me something. So the boy went home to his father. Who thanked heaven for having given him such? Who thanked heaven for having given him such a smart son? One day, God said, this is what I'll do. I'll send down my son, I'll send him down to you to clear up this humpity bumpity hell of blue. His name will be Christ and he'll never wear shoes and his friends will call him the King of the Jews. He didn't come in a plane, he didn't come in a jeep, he didn't come in the pouch of high jumping bovee. He rode on the back of the black of Saskatoon, black in his future, he ever could you. He rode into Jerusalem, home of the grumpy Jews, where false prophets worshipped some even in two. There was Murray Bumper and Genghis for Boos, one to worship taking a snooze. Christ spoke from a mound, and people gathered around, but he came sound. Thus he spake, Sin and socks, socks full of sin, how shall we quiet this Jehovah din? Do unto others as others do unto you. That includes you, Timothy Foo. And one Pharisee said to another he knew, What shall we do about this uppity Jew? Wash him in wine and make him all clean, and into Sam Vidal's crucifixion machine. Twirl the gorl and release the gavlees, and in go the nails as fast as you please. And he said, he said as he bled, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, because they walk through this world wearing two crappity shoes. Do you? Amen.
beauty of woman and a wise heart's words. Men at arms in their nobility, the colloquies of love, the songs of birds, and handsome ships on the fast running sea, calm this air of daybreak wings, white snow falling on a windless day, a flowing brook, a meadow full of blooms silver and gold and lapis in array. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one man, for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another and assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect of the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by the universe with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments instituted by men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. And whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles, and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for lighter transient causes. And experience accordingly has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffering when evils are sufferable than right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they have become accustomed. But when long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces the design to use them under absent despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government, provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patience and sufferance of these qualities, and such is the necessity which constrains them to alter their formal systems of government. The history of the present King of England is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny of the state. To prove this, let facts be to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. It is to refuse assent to laws most wholesome and necessary for the public good. Shiva something.
Hola, mi amigo. I don't know if that's the right way to say hello, my friend, in Spanish. Like sound, fool. My first thought was he lied in every word, that hoary cripple with malicious eye asked him to watch the working of his lie on mine, the mouth scarce able to afford suppression of the glee the first in score its edge at one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff? What saved Whaley with his lies and snare? All travelers who might find him posted there, and ask the road. I guessed with skull-like laugh would break what crutch can write my epitaph the past time in the dusty thoroughfare. If at his counsel I should turn aside into on this track which all agree hides the dark tower, it acquiescingly I had turn as he pointed, and I had cried no hope kindling at the end of scry, so much as gladness I meant to be. For what with my whole world wide wandering, what with my search drawn out through years, I hope the wind dove into a close up hope that obstreperous joy success would bring. I hardly tried now to rebuke the spring, my heart made finding failure in the scope. As a sick man, very near to death, seems dead indeed, and feels beginning in the tears, and takes a farewell of each friend, and hears one bid the other go, draw a breath freely on his side, since all is over, he saith, the blow falleth and we can amend. While some discuss the other graves be room enough for this, but when a day suits best for carrying your corpse away, with terrible banners stuck on the stage, and still the man is all in own trade, you may not shame such tender love and stay. Thus I have for so long suffered in this quest, heard failure prophesied so oft being writ, so many times among the band of wit, the knights who two dark towers search address their steps, that just to fail as they seem best, 
and all doubt was now should I be fit. So quiet as despair I turned from him, the hateful cripple, out of his highway into the path he pointed. All the day had been a dreary one at best, and dim was settling into its close, yet shot one grim red leer to see the plain catch its astray. For Mark, no sooner was I fairly found, pledged to pain after pace or two, than pausing for back the last view, over the safe road twas gone, gray plain all round, nothing but plain with horizons bound, I must go on, naught else remain to do. So on I went, I think I never saw some starved and global nature, nothing throve, for flowers as well expect a cedar grove, but chortle and spurge according to their law, might propagate their kind with none to awe, you think a bird would mean a treasure trove. No penury and root to single makes in some strange sort where the land's portion, see or close your eyes at nature peevishly, and nothing skills, I can't help my case, tis last judgment's fire must cure this place, calcite its claws and set my prisoners. If there pushed any ragged to so stop above its mates, its head was chopped. The bents were jealous else. What made the holes and rents in the dock's harsh source leaves? Bruised as to balk all hope of greenness. Tis a brute must walk, passing the life oath of brutes and tents. As for the grass, it grew as scarce as hair and leprosy. Thin, dry blades pricked the blood with every leaf. Which under leaf of meted up with blood. One stiff blind horse in every bone is there. Stupefied, however, he came there. Thrust no past service from the devil's stud. Alive, he might be dead for aught I know, with red gaunt and calic night restrained, and shut eyes beneath the rusty mane. Seldom went such grotesqueness with such woe. I never saw a brute I hated so. He must have been wicked to deserve such pain. I shut my eyes and turned them on my heart, as a man calls for wine before he fights. I asked one draft of earlier, happier sights. There fit that I could hope to play the part. Think for his fight afterwards, a soldier's art. One taste of all time sets all to rights. No, I did. I fancied Cuthbert's reddening face beneath its garniture of curly gold. Dear fellow, though I almost felt him full. He nodded in mind to fix me to that place. The way he used, alas, when night's disgrace, I went my heart's new fire and left it cold. Giles, then, the soul of honor, there he stands. Frank is ten years ago and night at first. An honest man should dare, he said he durst. Good, but the scene shifts. Thaw, what hangman's hand pinned to his breast the parchment, his own band reads it, poor traitors spit upon and cursed. Better this present than a past like that, back therefore to my darkening path. No sound of sight as far as the eye can strain, will the nights and hallowed or a bad ass, when something on the dismal flat came to rest my thoughts and change their train. A sudden little river crossed my path, as unexpected as a serpent came. No tides congenial to the glooms. This, if as a froth flies, might have been a bath in a fiend's glowing hoof to see the wrath of its black eddies be spat with flakes and spoons. So petty yet so spiteful, all along low scrubby alders kneeled over it. Drenched willows flung them headlong in a fit of rout despair, a suicidal throng. The river which had done them all the wrong, whatever that was, rolled by to turn no wit. Which while I forded good saints, how I feared to set my foot upon a dead man's cheek. Each step or feel the spear I thrust to seek for hollows tangled in his hair or beard. It may have been a water rat I speared, but I'll get sounded like the baby shriek. Glad was I to reach you at the bank, now for a better country. Vain presage, who are the strugglers? What war did they wage? Who savage trampled for this path of dank soil to a plash? Toads in a poison tank, or wild cats in a red hot cage? The fight must so have seemed in that foul circle. What pen them there with all the plain to choose? No footsteps leading to that horrid muse. None out of it. Mad druids set to work their brains, no doubt, like galley slaves to Turk. Good for his pastime, Christians against Jews. And more than that, if her long on, why there? What bad use was that engine for? That wheel, a great nut wheel, that arrow fits real men flying out like silk. With all the air of the prophet's school, on earth left unaware, brought to sharpen its rusty teeth with steel. Then came some stub ground, once the wood next to marsh we'd seen. Now we had heard, desperate had done us, so the fool finds her. Made the thing and mars it, till it new changes, and off he goes. Within a rude bog lay a marsh, sand and stark black dirt. Now blotches brightly in color of day and grim. Now patches worse than meanness of the soil, broke through moss and substances like boils. Then came a palm beetle, a cleft of him, a distorted wealth that splits its rim, gaping at death and dies by like coils. As far as ever from the end, not in the distance but leaving not, point my footsteps further than I thought. Great black bird, Apollyon's bosom friend, sailed past and beat his wide wings, dragon pen, 
the brush of my cap for the side I saw it. For looking up where I somehow grew, the plain had given place all around the mountains with such names of grace, mere heights of heat fell stolen of you. All this has surprised me solving you. How to get her from there was no clear case. Yet half of I seem to recognize the trick of mischief had happened to me, God knows when, in a bad dream perhaps. Here ended then progress this way, when in the very nick of giving up one more time came and clicked as when the trap trips you're in the den. Burningly it came upon me all at once. This was the place, those two hills crouched like two bulls locked horn and horn in fight. All to the left, the tall scout mountain, dunce daughter and dozing at the very nuts after a lifetime of training for the sight. Not what in the midst lay but the tower itself, the round squat turret, blind as a fool's heart. Built of brown stone without a counterpart in the whole world. The tempest mocking out points his ship and thus the unseen shelf. He strikes on only when timbers start. Not see, because of night perhaps, why day came back for that. Behind and left the dying sunset, kindled to a cleft, the hills like two giants in the hunting lay, chin upon hand to see the game at bay, now stab and end the creature to the heft. Not here, when noise was everywhere it told. Increasing like a bell, names in my ears, of lost adventurers, my peers. How such was strong, and such was bold, and such was fortunate in each of old. Lost, lost, from the moment now full of years. There they stood, ranged along the hillside, but few the last of me for one more living. To be the last of me, a living flame, for one more picture in a sheet of flame. I saw me and knew me. I saw them and knew them all, and yet, dauntless, suddenly to my lips I sat and blew, a child rolling to a dark tower came. Thank you, uh, Gaffrey17. Are you still there, Gaffrey? Gaffra. 